Hey, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 637. That is 637 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing well. How am I? You know how it is. All things are good on my end. Trying to keep my head above water and keep one foot in front of the other and do the things I need to do in order to keep on progressing and make my life worth living. Is that enough information for you and you're happy with that? I'm happy with that. If you're not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, man, it's been a while, isn't it? Um, I've been a bit up and down, been a bit all over the place, um, figuring stuff out as per usual. I put up my New Year's Eve resolution that I'm currently on at the moment. That's, you know, been kicking my ass a little bit. I'm not going to lie. So that's been pretty mad. I've started to realize just how little time in a day there is to do the things I actually want to do, right? I think I specked out a list of my New Year's resolutions that I kind of shared on a previous podcast, which is about six to seven things I kind of wanted to use as guard rails to kind of guide me throughout the entirety of the year and for the most part i estimated that i would need about four to six hours per day to do such task which include running which include reading one hour per week no, one hour per day sorry which included which minimum sorry which included finishing a few books and all this other stuff and you know keeping up a t- particular mileage in terms of um, running outside and whatnot and i thought it would be about four to six hours per day and it's about right but just imagine at the moment now if you're currently working eight days or eight hours sorry per day and you're sleeping a minimum of maybe seven to eight again and then whatever else in between you're doing whatever stuff you need to do just imagine taking out four hours of your time per day to commit to something like that it's a lot it really takes a lot especially if you don't do it a lot beforehand prior you know especially myself um, i think i had really good discipline and habits pre-pandemic i was a completely different person i think most of us can say that out here we were completely different people pre-pandemic and i think pre-pandemic i was way more disciplined even though i was a bit crazy with the things that i did outside of my um the things that i should be doing i was still living a somewhat debaucherous um fueled lifestyle i had a very hard line in terms of the things that i did monday to friday but as soon as the pandemic happened and it kind of gave me an excuse to be lazy i did it which is weird because I think the world didn't give me an excuse because it kept on churning, kept on moving, kept on moving. And I currently, or at the time, I wasn't anywhere closer to getting to my dreams. So I was thinking, you know what? I can't be lazy because if I be lazy and the world keeps moving, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to be further and further and further and further and further behind. So I didn't want to do that. So I tried to put myself best foot forward. But when it turned out to be a thing of the pandemic where essentially we were all kind of paid to be lazy, right? The world kind of encouraged us to take a break, to relax. Remember they were sharing all those images of, oh, look, the ocean, the ocean is blue, it's clear. You can see the all the fishies and the turtles and the sharks. It's like, oh, wow. Now, you know, our flipping imprint, our um, thumbprint, our touch has been removed from the earth it's now breathing and healing again so we were kind of encouraged to sort of lay back in our rocking chair lay back in our deck chairs and observe everything from afar while we're eating grapes and enjoying ourselves gorging on the third or fourth uber east delivery of the day and clearly 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 that wasn't the right thing to go about that wasn't the right way to go about things right we're in the 21st century we cannot afford to take our foot off the pedal we cannot afford to be lazy we cannot afford to be on the front foot and to be constantly thinking about how we're going to maintain our current level um you know of whatever we have now at the moment we have to always be in the front of our mind because if it's not Someone's going to come in with an NFT scam. Someone's going to come in with a crypto scam. Someone's going to come in and dupe us and tell us, hey, get rich quick with this thing. And we're going to be like, oh, we'll jump on it. Someone's going to come in with a PP loan thing. You're going to be like, oh, shit, I can get a PP loan. I can get myself a range of a truck and you're going to go crazy. That's what happens. But when we're all focused on working in all our different you know, avenues, whether it be working on something amazing, whether it be working a dead end job, It actually is the best thing because it distracts you from all the nonsense. There's no time to think about, you know, NFTs and Litecoin and CryptoZoo and blockchains when you're legitimately working 10 hours per day in a retail store somewhere, lugging in boxes into the flipping main door. You've got no time to be thinking about CryptoZoos. But suddenly, when you're at home and you're getting checks through the mail from the government or whatever assistance and you're not working or you're working, quote, quote, from home on your laptop, of course, 
those those get rich quick schemes are going to sound um you know they're going to sound enticing of course they're going to sound enticing so we were kind of all kind of duped into this weird um you know comatose state that we're in at the moment and i've luckily i've just about awoke you know woke myself up from it and i think i'm getting back to where i need to be but it's still taking a long time it's coming from somebody i would say i have a very high level of self-discipline i have a very high level of drive but even i've noticed my ability to kind of be a bit lazy and to enjoy the malaise and what is mean life is hard the pandemic the economy blah 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 let's go on and on when really the truth of it the world is not that dissimilar to what it was pre-pandemic yeah things have changed but in 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 you know at the core of it is still what it, what we know it to be really and truly if you think about it it's still what we know it to be so clearly the issues are always going to remain they're always going to be there it's just your ability to respond to them it's your ability to dodge all the landmines and it's your ability to ensure to ensure your future the future of your family your friends your future family whatever it may be that is your responsibility that is your main responsibility and that's what i've been kind of looking forward to so i've always liked january and the start of the year for that because it allows some level of clarity because there's hardly anything on i look at ra now and events and there's not really many parties that i'm really pushing to go to so that's why my brain is sort of like, you know, like okay cool let's get ourselves where we need to be focus locked in so that these mistakes that we did prior are not going to happen again and we're going to have 2023 be the best year possible the best year possible now talking about best years talking about best years talking about best years i'm wondering because i, I know the answer to this right but have you ever have you ever dear audience have you ever ever in your entire life cancelled postponed or rescheduled a holiday because you haven't got enough drip no, I know that. Because the drip hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> I can't say enough because, you know, that would be me being a little bit delusional because I have a wardrobe full of clothes. But have you ever cancelled, postponed, or rescheduled a holiday because the drip you were anticipating on arriving did not arrive on time? <laughs> I'm doing that. I am. I'm doing that. That's why I never, ever, ever understand why somebody could ever try and question my loyalty to drip my loyalty to this fashion thing my passion for it right my passion for the fashions you can never ever question it i don't care who you are where you are you're never ever going to passion it because or passionate you're never going to outpassion me for one because i had to learn all my shit from the hood i was buying vogue magazines and my local news agents and devouring them in my bedroom and having you know people you know throw weird glances at me in my home maybe thinking that i was gay because i was into this stuff and i really cared about it i was buying new york time magazines and for the style mag inside and finding out about csm on that magazine so i found out about central Saint martins through reading an article in the flipping style magazine that was a free little pamphlet that came inside of sunday times um uh broadsheets right on, on sunday and i also found out about it off the back of that kind of you know my first knowledge of it and then the second was when i went to school um sorry i was in sixth form and i had you know i didn't have the best relationship with my grad my art teacher at the time at sixth form for a levels even though i was really good at it i kind of well, had a bit of a big head you know generally and kind of didn't think that i needed to do the work and i kind of just turned up and you know churned out you know masterpiece after masterpiece i thought so in my head and of course when she called me out on it i didn't respond too well and then we had a bit of a combative relationship so it wasn't you know it wasn't really her fault it was mostly mine but i do remember her being a little bit you know a little bit petty to be honest she probably shouldn't have done that because you know you're a teacher and you need to kind of get over things but she didn't like me at all and she'd never really kind of let go of it and then towards the end when we, when we were getting all our um when we we're getting all our offers in from schools oh yeah hey this offer from whoever you apply to and you kind of share them with your teacher and some i don't know in some courses if you were gonna do the course in university it'd be nice to share a teacher oh by the way i'm in english i've so i got into oxford i'm going to cambridge oh my god it's amazing so one of the girls in our class um who actually fancied at the time which makes it even harder to take she got an acceptance letter from central st martin's oh my god miss look i got accepted to the foundation course or whatever it may be right and then the teacher's oh my god she was going crazy right and i never seen this woman happy she's kind of all that, that you know that standard sort of demure you know always smelt like an ashtray 
Um, she wore like all birds before all birds existed. Or no, I think she wore like croc trainers. Do you remember those things? Crocs used to make tr- no, no, it's not, no, no, sorry, not Crocs. Birkenstocks. Birkenstock have like a trainer. Not sure if they still sell it, but they're like a sneaker instead of a sandal. It's like a mule sneaker thing that was horrendous. So she used to wear those type of things and smoke like an ashtray. And she would, she would basically give this girl all these props. And I was sitting there brewing. Like, I've never seen you this happy in my entire life. You're always giving me stick and making me sound like I'm the flipping devil. And now you're kind of going over the board and, you know, celebrating this girl's victories. And I was like, oh, what the hell was St. Martin's anyway? And I remembered, oh, yes, I think I read in the magazine. That's the place that, um, what's his name? I remember, um, uh, I think his name is Williamson. It's this designer who used to make all these, like, floral type dresses and whatnot. And he did, I'm pretty sure he did, like, fashion or he did, like, um, textile design or something in CSM back in the day. And that's why I ended up replying, applying to go there. And that was kind of my kind of main sort of like kicking off point to get into this thing. Anyway, going back to the holiday thing. So I have postponed my trip that I was going to go to Berlin to recently. I was meant to go actually next week, I think I was meant to go. So now I've postponed it until sometime in February because the stuff that I wanted to wear on the trip hasn't arrived yet. And, and on top of it, on top of it, on top of it, I haven't lost the LBs that I wanted to before I left, which is flipping hilarious. So I'm not skinny enough yet and my clothes haven't arrived yet. That's why I'm not going to Berlin. Those are the two main reasons I postponed this holiday. So if you're wondering why I've not really been speaking about it too much or maybe you don't really care and I'm just updating you anyway because I'm oversharing that I have any real friends and you are my friends, then that is the reason why I'm not going anymore. So I'm going to go later on down the line sometime in february but i'm not going yet because a i'm not skinny enough and b i haven't got the clothes yet so if you do see me looking gaunt and you do see a kind of buccal fat faced agostino here in a few weeks you know why <laughs> you definitely know why it's absolutely ridiculous and a major all caps r word but hey what can you do what can you do so let's move on to the show I've got many things to talk about, many things I want to get your opinions on as well. One thing to start off with that I wanted to talk about was this TV series called Yellowstone. It's a Western TV show, nothing too crazy. Um, It's been all the rage in the States at the moment. I'm not really too sure why, because it's not amazing TV. It's good enough to watch, don't get me wrong. If you don't have anything to watch, it definitely is entertaining enough for you to put on and kind of while away, you know, 40 minutes to an hour, whatever it may be. But to say it's flipping Breaking Bad or The Wire or anything is really ridiculous. It's not on that level whatsoever. But somehow, I'm not too sure how they did it, right? Yellowstone's decent enough, but somehow, in the history of TV shows, I don't think it's ever happened, they've created prequels that are if not better than the main show, but also have kind of added to the main show and kind of expanded the Yellowstone universe. So these prequels, one is called, I think, 1921 or 1923, one of them, and the other one's called 1883. And essentially the prequels um, trace the history of the Dut- of the, I think the Dutton, I think that's what they're called, the Dutton family. And it kind of gives you an idea of who they were prior to you finding out the modern incarnation of them in you know Yellowstone. And you kind of get this whole kind of like um, unofficial history of America, the Americas, indigenous people, um, you know, religion, capitalism, slavery. And what I like about it, for me personally, what I like about it, having been a big, 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 huge fan of Westerns, um, I don't know why, actually. Maybe because my dad used to watch a lot of them. Yeah, maybe that is. Maybe my dad used to watch a lot of those type of movies. He was into a lot of that kind of old you know, black and white type stuff, you know, Clint Eastwood days. I think of things like, you know, The Good, The Bad and Yugly. I can think of watching back in the day, um, Treasures of Sierra Madre, High Noon, um, Stagecoach, what else? Um, Hello, High Water, that's a recent one. Um, but I've watched quite a few, right? True Grit, of course, but I've watched many, 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 many Westerns. So I'm a really big, 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 big fan. Oh yeah, sorry. Obviously the main one, isn't it? Being Unforgiven. And, I guess maybe because it kind of harkens back to a day in age where things were maybe a little more simpler. Maybe life was, people were just starting to figure out their positions in the world. Maybe things weren't as muddy as they were now. I'm not really too sure why. Maybe there's a personal responsibility thing, whatever it may be. But what I do like about it, and I do flip and give them a lot of credit for, is their really, um, is their kind of pursuit for an accurate representation of what the world looked like back then. 
There is no kind of unnecessary wokeness to it. It just is exactly what you'd kind of imagine it to be in terms of, you know, who the help is, who's working behind the bars, the kind of texture and tone of it, the brutality of it. It's all very real. And what I also like about it is that people would die. Like, you know, most of these shows that kind of depict this sort of stuff, the the hero, whatever it may be, or the people that are kind of, you know, you're determined to be quote unquote the good guys, they just find a way to survive. But in this you know in this brutal hellscape which is weird to watch because the scenery and the landscape is fucking gorgeous right middle america parts wherever they filmed this in in america is absolutely gorgeous like gorgeous gorgeous the plains the fields the hills the valleys like legitimately a place where you would legit go and try and fall asleep under the stars right but then you won't you probably wouldn't because you don't want to get you know eaten by a mountain lion or something but legitimately beautiful 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 landscapes all throughout you can't deny it anyway shape or form but what i love about it there's a parts of it where the family are kind of traversing across America to try and seek a better life for themselves, right? And their family. And back then, of course, there is no there is no way to kind of figure out or find out if the place you're going to go to is going to be what you think it's going to be until you go there. There is no way to get that message back to you. And sometimes people would, you know, send out signals or, hey, there's this new town we're building. Um, come over here for prosperity and the future for your family, school, something to do for your wife, whatever you may be doing. But they'll purposely get you to come, but then not allow you to send messages back. So it was a purposeful scam. So people were coming there under the guise that it was one thing. Then they arrive and they're like, oh, no, this is horrible. And it kind of reminds me of this movie I watched recently. I think it was on Netflix that kind of had a similar sort of angle a wartime movie uh, about um, the Second World War where they essentially were depicting the enthusiasm, I think, of these Austrian students before they went to sign up to the front line, to, to be on the front line. And they were thinking they were going to be part of this, I don't know what they were going to for a revolution or something. And they're really excited before they get there. And then when they finally do get there, they realize just how hellish it is. It's legitimately a hell environment and they can't understand how different it is from the image they had in their head or the reports that they were kind of receiving back home when they weren't actually there. So it was absolutely crazy. But I don't know the fact that when they're traversing across the United States in 1883, there are so many encounters where people just die randomly, right? From falling off a wagon and getting kind of trapped underneath a wheel, um, from getting attacked by animals at night, getting stung by snakes and scorpions. Um, there's a constant threat. It, it, it seems sort of like, it's, it, it makes a show incredibly tense there's always a threat of somebody coming to ambush you right these cowboys or wherever it may be just you're just minding your business chilling out and this horde of cowboys come and try and ambush you if it's not them it's indigenous people who maybe see you as a threat and you don't you don't understand each other's language so there's no way to kind of you know discourse and sort of like um stem any of that sort of hate it's just a constant barrage every single day right you feel like you're on on your back foot and it's pretty mad to watch but i do like it because i feel like it's like a legitimately one of the better accurate representations um, of what that world would have been like to live in in the real time so of course the acting performances from people like tim mcgraw and stuff and his wife faith hill they play the main you know main i don't know uh, uh actors in that in that series 1883 and their chemistry on tv is just so good um having it be a husband and a wife you know play a husband and a wife on tv screen is just incredible it kind of that chemistry and romanticism sort of leaps off of the screen and again i'm a bit of a romanticist when it comes to this sort of stuff um i'm a little bit of a history buff as well so maybe i like this stuff as well but just for me you know i just like to see the accurate representation of history from time to time on tv because i feel like sometimes a lot of this sort of like woke mob can get a little bit too sensitive about how things were and they don't like to see that depicted again on screen but as much as those slavery movies can be annoying it is quite uh, it is quite important to see what that life was like so that you can take um you can't take solace in the idea that nowadays things have definitely improved and it's not as bad as it once was but you have our issues 
but it definitely isn't as bad as people make it seem out to be. But legit, season one of 1883 is absolutely incredible. I really enjoyed it. I think the other one is called 1921, 1923. I'm not too sure which one it is. And that's been really good so far. Where I think we're two episodes deep or three, I think, so far on that one. Um, and like I said, I actually prefer the prequels to Yellowstone. Yellowstone, I've kind of started and stopped three or four times. I've not really got too into it. I think the longest I kind of watched it was up to about episode four of, of season one. But I found the prequels, I've sort of been able to run through them really, really easily. And they are w way harder to watch, I have to be honest. Like, because there's a lot of scenes in it that are quite, you know, quite disturbing and whatnot. But if you're a fan of Westerns like me, I definitely recommend you check it out, man. 1883 is absolutely incredible. I recommend you check it out. I recommend you check it out. Do we think there's a general lack of understanding with people who are generally quite divisive and um, they split opinion with the public, they create controversy out of absolutely nothing and always try and goad people into a reaction? Why do they seem to be the ones who lack the self lack self awareness the most? Never really understood that. The reason why I mention this is because there's this really interesting, quite funny back and forth going on between um, Six Nine and Boston Richie, right? And Boston Richie's been in the news lately a lot. Well, if you're following the urban hip hop type of thing, and like I do, you would have known that Boston Richie's been in the news because some other rappers out there have been exposing court documents and police reports about him allegedly snitching on some of his friends who were involved in some murders and other crimes and whatnot which resulted i think in one of them going to prison for 15 years or whatnot but for what we can see so far i think there are two so far solid reports that he did snitch on people that he was familiar with and then he got them obviously locked up because of the evidence you know contributed to them getting locked up for a long period of time which you would classify as definition of snitching for whatever reason, his side doesn't, you know, want to believe that to be the case. His team are fighting hard against it, which makes sense because Boston Richie's image entirely does depend on the fact that he doesn't snitch because he's quite an aggressive, you would deem it to be street um, rapper in that respect. And obviously most of his lyrics are sort of centered around that sort of thing. So having it be known that you are a legit snitch is probably going to be bad for business. So I understand on their side of things, do that. Boston Richie's going to have his way to deny it also, but he's doing it in a weird way. He's posted a picture recently of him holding up stacks of money or whatnot, showing off, which is always hilarious. Whenever someone calls you out, the first thing you do is say how much money and, you know, itches you fugged. And it's always really, really funny because that's obviously not what we're talking about. But clearly, you feel so insecure that you're having to flex on the money without actually addressing the point at hand. But we digress. So 6 9 feels like he's been slighted. Because he feels like Boston Richie isn't getting the same level of attention and scrutiny that he was getting. He thinks he's had the same issue with Gunner and his alleged snitching. And he's kind of been on this one man campaign to convince everybody that everyone out there is as big as a snitch as he is, which is a fool's errand, really, because it's sort of like saying, hey, I'm not the only creep. There are loads of other creeps out there. It's like, yeah, but you're still a creep. So sit your ass down. So with the snitching thing, when it comes to 6 9 I feel like. It's one thing, the snitching thing, for you to have an issue with him for doing what he did. The main issue I have with 6 9 when it comes to snitching thing, and it's somebody that's not attached to any of that sort of life in the slightest, just from an observer point of view, is the scandalous nature of it. That's the real part of it. That's, kind of, that's really hard to kind of swallow, even if you're a fan of his. Like, just how scandalous he was with the whole issue. He had no shame, no class, no remorse, no nothing in what he'd done. And you think back to how he was prior, and I enjoyed his music prior. I, I think I said on record on the podcast a few times that I liked his albums in the gym because they were like 30, no, I think they were like minute max was like maybe 40 minute runtime on an album that he put out. And they were legit the best sort of music to get you fired and pumped up in the gym. So if I was going to do a WOD or I went to like a really big, you know, strength and conditioning workout for 40 minutes and I didn't really have want to have that many breaks. I just wanted to go in hard. I'll slap on a 6 9 album from start to finish and it will just get me pumped and ready to go. But it kind of came different. But the part of the reason why he likes it is because of the aggression, the sort of like 
the disrespect that he was coming up at it with every single record. And you saw it reflected in real life because he was legitimately running down on people. He was putting it on people. He was going to people's shows. He was saying the most flagrant things on interviews. Like he was legitimately going, you know, beyond and above, far and beyond and above to kind of demonstrate just how street and how down he was to get down with anything and what time, you know, he was on, he was on, he was on that, that time from minute zero. And you kind of appreciate it. Even if you didn't believe it, you appreciate that energy that he was coming with. So that framed a lot of his sort of identity. Then it obviously, you know, as, you know, everything kind of rolls out and the issues come to head. And then he starts to snitch. And the snitching thing for me was super, super horrible because I remember one particular case of it was like the guy that he allegedly paid money to to put a hit, to go and do a hit on flipping Chief Keith, which, you know, thankfully didn't work or didn't happen the way it needed to happen and whatnot, he ended up snitching on that guy. And I was thinking to myself, like, how corrupt or how twisted is the American judicial system where you can pour a hit on somebody, you can snitch on the person you used for the assassination, and then you get out before they do? Like, how does that make any sense? And he did it to everybody else involved, right? He was in and around the rooms. Again, maybe you can you can blame Nine Trey Crips, whoever they are, or Nine Trey for essentially bringing him around when he clearly wasn't like that guy to be around those sort of conversations. But everything he eavesdropped on, everything he was in the midst of when it was happening, he reported on. And he essentially, if I'm not mistaken, got, you know, upwards of 10 people basically put behind bars, contributed to. And if that wasn't enough, he added other people that weren't even involved in the case. He started to talk about Cardi B's alleged gangs, gang links, um, Jim Jones. Loads of things were kind of, you know, involved in that whole shebang. And then obviously when he came out, he was unremorseful. He didn't want to go in witness protection. He started flaunting himself around there, saying he can't be touched. I'm a snitch, so what? Because I think the first time when he came out, actually, he was fighting against the snitch thing. Then he started embracing it. Then he started fighting against it. And I feel like whenever I listen to 6 9 talk, especially when he's on like Clubhouse or something, and he's with like Wack 100, it always feels like whenever Wack 100, you know, doesn't necessarily let him speak with that sort of bass in his voice about gangs and snitching, he kind of gets a bit offended, which is really strange for somebody who you would deem to be a serial snitcher to get offended when somebody calls him out who's actually associated a part of that lifestyle that now nah, now nah, you can never talk about this sort of stuff because of what you did and you're kind of xed out of it wherever it may be and i always found that hilarious but for me the main part i think is different from six nine with all these other people that i've been stitching is that fundamentally even when I liked 6 9 as a rapper and I liked him as a musician, he was never liked. He was never likable. People always hated him. Like, there was always this meme that would go around on the internet. Whenever a prominent rapper would die, people would leave a comment saying like, oh, why doesn't this... Why did? Why couldn't it happen to 6 9 instead? Why take him? Why not take 6 9 It was a constant meme that was going around. I'm sure those sort of things got to 6 9 right? He, he, he acts like he doesn't, you know, feel anything and he's unemotional, but I'm sure those things definitely got to him seeing people essentially wish on his death because they just didn't like him as a person. Um, and obviously when he, he snitched, it kind of obviously didn't help uh, people warm to him in any kind of way and his reaction to it wasn't the greatest either. But still, he doesn't seem to understand it and I don't really understand, and I don't really understand why he doesn't get it. So there's this um, post here I'm going to upload on the screen. So the no, post courtesy of DJ Academics where it looks like from 6ix9ine's Instagram account, where he's taken a picture of the report or the snitch report, basically. And he said the following, I've never seen the whole rap game quiet. Everyone has something to say. Now people don't got voices or opinions about Boss and Richie. And clearly he's upset about Boss and Richie getting the kid gloves when he was attacked from left to right. He was included in every single song and people were basically going out of their way to chastise him and kick him while he was down. Whereas Boston Richie, people are basically turning a blind eye or similar to what was happening with Gunner. People don't seem to be ready and willing to kind of, you know, counsel them or say it's over because they generally maybe like them as people. They maybe think they're more gangs. So I don't really know what the issue is. But for me personally, the fundamental issue when it comes to 6 9 is that he's just not likable. It's as simple as that. He's not a likable person. He never was. What he did was incredibly heinous. Um, he got people locked up that he legitimately took part in crimes with, which is absolutely crazy. Probably what Boston, Boston Richie did also, but that whole, you know, the optics of it don't look the greatest. And of course, Boston Richie then went out and replied himself. And he said the following on his, on his Instagram stories, the difference between me and you, 6 9 is I never told her on a nigger or put a nigger in jail and I'm pressure tape out public housing to nigger, whatever it may be. So, 
clearly they both don't accept that they're snitches. Boston Richie doesn't accept he's a snitch, and Six Nine doesn't accept he's a snitch. And I guess it's up to the consumer to decide what they want to do. Personally, I don't think it actually matters in the grand scheme of things. I think when you're a fan of somebody's music, um, especially myself included, I take the whole package as is. And if certain things are, you know, deemed to be not the way that I thought they were, or they're not the kosher, they're not authentic, but the music is still good, I'm still going to listen to it because I'm always here for the music first. But there's no denying that if you do end up snitching, especially if you end up, I guess it's different if you end up just like still on that time because 6 9 hasn't really changed his temperament. It's not like he's come out and said, yeah, I'm about peace and love. He's still on whatever time everyone else is on. So just because he snitched doesn't mean he's not going to blow your head off if you try and approach him in real life. So that's clearly an issue. But I feel like in some people's eyes, especially the guys that these guys want to impress, because that's the thing when you're a, when you have these sort of gang affiliations and you're a well-known artist, you clearly want to impress or, um, you know, carry the favor of people who this sort of stuff means a lot to. So if you do this and it gets out, those people aren't going to look at you the same way. And which is funny, isn't it? Because these guys probably have millions of fans worldwide who would love to see them perform in their small towns they don't care about the stitching things but these guys care more about people who aren't necessarily their fans and don't pay their bills or don't contribute to pay their bills or buy their merch or buy their albums or anything or so you know any type of way so their kind of attention is really in the wrong place but you know hip-hop and you know gang politics is something that's always been interwoven from the very beginning the very onset of the genre so it's not something that's going to be gone anytime soon but i do find the back and forth between six nine and, and boston richie to be kind of hilarious considering they both definitely did snitch they both definitely can't be um you know seen as the same level of gangster they were prior doesn't mean like they're both not dangerous doesn't mean that they're both not on go time if anything was up but still, you kind of, you kind of, you kind of have to give up um, speaking about certain things when you do get snitched on. But maybe that's what we live in the society nowadays. We live in a society, I think I've said it before, that we live in a society where everybody just wants everything. So they want the image of being a gangster. They want to also be able to snitch and not be called a snitch. And they also want to still have the ability to call themselves you know, um, 100% far or whatever it may be, right? Um, because despite the snitch allegations, it's like, no, like sometimes your decisions that you make can take away from the thing that you built, you built over a long period of time, history, right? Because I'm sure there are gangsters out there that can exist who have done hits on people who have snitched. You know, you look back to some of the organized crime syndicates, uh, the mob and whatnot, there are hitmen in there that have snitched and they've killed, you know, they've got like, you know, 20 plus bodies on them. It doesn't mean that that person's not dangerous. It just means that when he was, you know, put, when it, the reality situation came to him and he was faced with looking at double digit prison sentence and he wasn't able to see his kids and his family again, he decided, no, I'm going to see my family again. I'm going to snitch. But it doesn't mean that person isn't really with it. So it's a double-edged sword. But hey, for me personally, I'm not you know, I'm not gonna stop listening to Boston Richie because of the allegations, but I do find his uh, back and forth with Six Nine to be absolutely hilarious. And I find Six Nine's utter unex I, I find Six Nine's refusal, complete refusal to accept that he's just not likable. That's why some people just want to wish the worst on him as opposed to other people. I find that really hilarious too, because you would imagine if you're someone like a Six Nine and you're a bit of a troll, you have the rainbow hair, you have all the funny tattoos, you make all these, you know, nonsense track records, you're always kind of doing all these stunts online to get people to go do into reaction, to say something to you, you would imagine that you would be understandable, you'd, you'd be more understanding as to why some people don't like you, but for some reason he doesn't, and it is what it is, I guess. Moving on with that one, um, a track came out recently featuring Quavo um, that I thought was really good, and I thought was super emotional, and if anything, has been quite a sobering um thing to kind of see in real time um considering what's been happening with Quavo obviously um, you know since takeoff's untimely passing and if anything this has probably been a way to say this has probably been the first I feel like human reaction we've had from a hip-hop artist when it comes to a tragedy I feel like personally for me like this has been what we kind of would assume it would be like if you lost somebody close to you because I know a lot of these guys, especially some of the Chicago dudes, 
you know, they, they've grown up in hellish environments. And I think I've heard, you know, little Dirk say, so he's kind of got that kind of dead, starey eye look to him. I think I've heard um, G Herbo say it, where they can't cry. They don't have an ability to cry anymore because they've lost so many people, you know, in their young lives that they've kind of become numb to um, having any sort of real emotion when a close friend of family member passed away, which is pretty bleak. But you can understand why that is the case. Then there's this other group of people who just, I don't know if they use anything that happens to them as some sort of like promotional tool or marketing campaign. I don't know what it is. Or maybe just like try and make good out of every situation. But you see it happening, you see it happening with the Megan Thee Stallion thing, which I think with Tory Lane shooting, which I think was more of an issue of optics than it was really of people believing one or either the side. Because I think when she initially got shot, I remember one of the things that kind of was really didn't sit right with me was when you saw Megan out straight away, like going to DJ Khaled's house, going to clubs, all this sort of stuff. It just seemed strange. Like you just got shot. You made such a big deal out about it, crying online, being very emotional and clearly something that was very traumatic. And now suddenly you're back in a club, just like nothing ever happened. And then when people call you that out and are a bit skeptical about it, you get annoyed. It's like, no, that's not, the, that's not normal reaction people have to being shot. You don't just like get back outside and start living your everyday life. People that have sometimes seen other people get killed in front of them. And it's not even them get shot. It's someone else get shot or the person, maybe it's a person that didn't die. And that leaves a, you know, a bit of trauma on you that you still can't maybe get over. So the fact that those people were reacting so weirdly to it and kind of got, it just seemed weird. Obviously in the end, we find out that Tory Lanez probably did shoot her, but still um, those optics didn't really, you know, lend themselves to making whatever version of events that she had to be, you know, believable. But anyway, going back to the Quavo song, Without You, this feels like the first human reaction we've seen from a rapper to losing somebody close to them. When the takeoff thing happened, tragic circumstances behind it because the whole you know argument between Quavo and somebody connected to um whatever that crew is um from J Prince Jr was really over nothing you you over you, you hear the um, there's a video clip going around where you kind of overhear um Quavo arguing with somebody and they're basically arguing about basketball or something or betting gambling nothing that would you would assume should lead to a shooting nothing at most a fight I keep saying it again most of these arguments should lead to a, hey, let's go around the back in the parking lot, square up and fight, no cameras or nothing, and then we'll just get on with our business. That's what it should be. But for some reason, it led to a shooting, and of course, unfortunately, Takeoff ended up losing his life. And you listen to that um, video, you're like, God almighty, this is so avoidable. And of course, you know, Takeoff being a, such a beloved uh, member of the Migos, maybe one of the favorites, I would think, out of all of them, um, because of how chill and laid back he was and he was kind of the alt you know the alt character in the group somebody that clearly liked um things that were maybe outside the traditional kind of hip-hop sphere and whatnot just generally you know a cool dude made good music had good hooks and um, contributed a lot to the amigos and this is the first time i felt like i've seen a real reaction from a rapper because quavo in this video looks so gaunt looks so skinny he's, he's always been a skinny slim guy anyway but you can clearly see in his face the stress um you can clearly see how much he's struggling listening back to the record himself in the studio i'm not too sure if this was the first run that he listened to it but he's even struggling to hold these emotions in hearing some of the bars that he wrote because i'm assuming he probably went into the i can imagine because i've done it myself when i've been going through a traumatic experience where i've written down loads of feelings that i had during the time then you read it back to yourself and you don't even recognize your own voice and that's with writing so I can imagine what that must sound like when you're recording a rap. He's listening back to it and he can't even, it, it feels like, you know, it's, a, it's like it's hitting him for the first time what he's saying. And at first I was listening to it. I'm not going to lie. It just seemed a bit weird to hear him kind of Quavo croning around you, right? Knowing that he's, you know, um, his nephew and he's one of his best friends and his literal brother passed away in such a tragic way. It can be a bit weird to hear him croning. It's like hearing Travis Scott make a tribute song to all those kids that died at Astro World, and you know, it sounds a bit strange. But once you get past those initial seconds of that strangeness, and you actually listen to what he's saying, and you you can hear the vi you can watch the video, see how you know distraught he looks. It's difficult to watch that and not have sympathy for him, and just not feel like this has probably been one of the most difficult times he's ever faced in his career ever into probably questioning everything about his life that he's ever questioned ever before going forward because you think about 
some of the videos you've watched of Quavo performances, whatever it may be, one constant theme in the background is always takeoff. People don't really think of it too much, but he's always in and around it. They were legitimately close. It wasn't even like a, you know, um, a, a new thing that you probably heard from from me, but you've seen pictures of them when they were youngsters as well, clearly hanging out, spending a lot of time together. So you can only imagine what that must have been like. And of course, him saying a thing in a bit in the record, like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because a lot of it you could say, which is kind of, you know, hard to take and hard to kind of say and fess up in. Most of it was probably his fault, right? Just in a bit, it just walk away and just de-escalate things and chill led to essentially to take off basically losing his life. And he wasn't even involved in the argument. That's a tragic circumstance of it. He was off in the cut, smoking, having a chill time, enjoying himself, doing what he does. And Quavo was the one more in the middle of everything. And before even take off knew what was happening, boom. You know what I mean? He's out um, because of um, some friendly fire, quote unquote. So you can imagine the weight of responsibility that Quavo feels that, you know, he may inadvertently caused the issue that led um, to Takeoff's untimely passing. But regardless, I think this is an incredible tribute. I really do recommend you check it out. It's on Quavo Hunter's channel now on YouTube. It's called Quavo Without You. I'm sure most of you have already seen it. It's already sitting on 4.2 million views with 421 upvotes. It's got 3.4 downvotes, which is funny. People always downvote things just for the sake of it. But legit, this might be one of the... Um, better sounding uh quavo tracks i've heard in a while of course because it's got some substance to it and there's a story to it that you can obviously um, relate to i'm sure people out there have lost someone close to them and have felt some personal responsibility regardless even if it isn't your fault um because maybe you weren't there you didn't speak to them or something something wherever it may be but man this is a tough one to watch i'm not going to lie to see him looking the way that he does is really tough it's like i said a little bit satisfying because it shows that there is you know, when we're looking at certain people not act, not reacting the way that we would react and kind of using tragedy as a way to promote stuff, it can kind of sit a bit, you know, weird with you in your spirit. But then when you see Quavo, who's been pretty much MIA on media, uh, online since it happened to take off, right? Um, I think we saw a clip of him at New Year's Eve out and about with Meek Mill and Diddy. Um, but then he didn't really, you know, he seemed like he was just there and trying to get his spirits up, but still wasn't really the same Quavo you kind of seen from before. But apart from that, you haven't seen much of Quavo at all. So clearly this has been affecting him a lot more than, you know, um, other stuff has affected other people, which is obviously unfortunate. But yeah, man, uh, RIP to take off. Really, really tragic situation all in. But I do recommend you check the track without you. I think it's a really good tribute to such an iconic rapper who basically was taken gone gone too soon in my opinion definitely definitely gone too soon moving on quickly i won't touch upon this because i think this is really really incredible and i'm really happy to see this article here shared this is courtesy of the telegraph and it features an article um which features eric ten Hag talking about the unimaginable number of bad signings united have made over the years and what he's trying to do to basically change that around and make it not so not to be a thing right that's basically what he's trying to do i'm trying to help you guys so that you guys are not going to be so terrible going forward that's essentially what he's telling us so thank you eric Tenard, thank you the one thing i want to say about this which is really kind of comforting as united fan it's just nice to see us being managed by a legit top level high level manager like this is what it should be like because i feel like a lot of united fans have been duped into thinking people like Oli Gunnar Solskjaer were good enough to get the job done. But I think what we've seen with our club, especially with the Glazers' ownership, is that because the structure of our club is so bad, you kind of need an elite manager to offset all the things structurally and organisational-wise that are bad in order for us to kind of see anything popping off in the pitch. And I think that's what Eriton Hag has done. He's signed a few decent players in the transfer window. He's established some discipline. He's established a good good amount of teamwork, hard work, um, personal responsibility. He's got rid of the bad actors and essentially, or the bad influences in the dressing room, and essentially now he's got this team back into shape in a, in a way where you're seeing a somewhat um, rosy future, in, you know, coming up. Because you look at what Ericsson Hug has done so far at United, you think to yourself, if we get a decent owners in once the Glazers do sell, we could actually be onto something. Like legit. We could legitimately be onto something if we get some decent owners. And that's what we always wanted to see. We just wanted to see if it's possible to kind of get this current crop of players to play our standard that would give you hope for the future. And not, not kind of um, 
not sort of a rose tinted colored future nothing too crazy where you're like oh man we're gonna win the league next season no 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 no. but you can see there's a clear progression like over time with good structure with good owners with good transfer policies with good youth you know um youth squad integration whatever it may be with an improvement in our health and fitness and injury prevention places we can definitely see united getting back to where they need to be and i'm really happy about that so this article courtesy of the um telegraph has some really interesting quotes on here from ten Hag, which says the following Ten Hag has overseen seven straight wins as the United Revolution starts at pace, a far cry from the side he was saw when he first started the job. The quote from Eric Ten Hag. There was no spirit, he said. I saw no team dynamic in the squad. The mental resilience was very low, for sure. I saw that as an outsider and also noticed in my first weeks as the club. I looked at the culture of the club and I asked, how did Man United become great? The club has become unimaginable. The club has bought an unimaginable number of players in recent years who have not been good enough. And I think a lot of us fans said this, right? We knew us from the very beginning. We know our club inside and out. We know we overpaid for a lot of very average players. And for whatever reason, we also seem to be a very strange, strange, strange club you know, we don't have an ability to let go of players that are terrible. We seem to let go of the good ones. Like I look at a player like a Daily Blind, right? He was let go, obviously under the flipping tutelage of flipping Jose Mourinho. He ends up going to Ajax and, you know, doing great. And now he's going to buy Munich, one of the most elite clubs in the world. So clearly we tend to kind of bet on the wrong horses. But hey, whatever it may be, it continues here. Most purchases have been average. And at United, average is not good enough. United's t-shirt weighs heavily. Um, he says here uh, only real personalities who can perform under great pressure can play here he says we needed personalities that's why the acquisition of Casemiro was so important along with Rafa Ran. we now have a second player who has experience of winning titles Malasia, Martinez, Casemiro, Anthony are all fighters while Christian Eriksen is a technical winner and a great personality we want the best of, we want the best of the best any players we bring to Man United must meet the highest of standards and I'm so happy to hear that from him because for the longest time, we never really had the highest of standards. We had the good enough standards, the uh, paper over the crack standards, the appease fan standards with the glitzy signing, even though that person isn't the right culture or the right cultural fit for our dressing room or for the club overall. I was going to upset the dynamic of the dressing room. And now we finally got a manager in charge who's actually in charge, an actual authorit authoritative figure. And that's really, really good to see. So clearly we're on the right track. And all we need now are some decent owners. And we might eventually get back to where we need to be. We might eventually get back where we need to be. And I'm happy for that. I am legitimately happy. Moving on from that one, we're going to quickly touch upon this article first, courtesy of the BBC, which is called The Cost of Living, Heavy and Poverty in England's Least Deprived Areas. And the reason why I had to pull this up because I remember when I was growing up, part of why living in poverty is so weird and such a bit of a mind F is that you never really realize you're in poverty until you get out of your little bubble that you're in. And I remember living in a very rough part of East London, Customer slash Canning Town, growing up in a very dodgy time, growing up around people who maybe didn't like the color of your skin, <laughs> right? And just never really having enough to eat, to drink, whatever it may be, and just always kind of being on the brink of struggling all the time. But then having weird moments, because I think you live in the poverty area, you always have your weird kind of moment where you kind of get flushed with money whether it's a job whether it's a promotion whether it's a loan there are some times where you kind of do well and what your parents or your family try and do when you when they've got some money in their pocket is that they want to splurge they want to make you feel good for all the times that you haven't felt good and sometimes getting the ability to have a mcdonald's or to you know eat a particular chocolate bar to go to a particular restaurant or get some new trainers it really does lift your spirits it legit lifts your spirits it legitimately makes you feel like all those years of suffering this one little you know um temporary moment of you buying into a double cheeseburger is going to make everything great and sometimes it does make everything feel great but you never realize until you move out how legitimately poor you were like back then you don't realize it how most people in your area were starving on the brink but they just kept it. They just kept it um, respectful. They kept it hidden. They kept it private. They didn't really want to tell too many people. And one thing I remember happening that was a big thing I've seen nowadays was people using food banks, people going to um, soup kitchens to go and grab a meal, like legit things. Because I remember doing that when I was going to um, when I went to a sixth form and we did this sort of like community outreach thing with this Catholic church. 
And one thing I remember doing when we went to this Catholic church is that we worked in the soup kitchen briefly. And I remember one of the things that was quite surprising about it was that number one, the amount of people that are homeless that were coming in there was really crazy. The doors didn't stop opening. People were coming in like, you know, every single 10 minutes of drinking people coming in, um, you know, wanting a hot meal and a hot drink. And also the range of people. There were legitimate people there that I saw who didn't look homeless to me. Just look like they needed a meal. They hadn't eaten in a while. Like they hadn't had a real home cooked hot meal, quote unquote, in a long time. Or they hadn't, you know, eaten anything apart from a sandwich in a while. And they wanted some soup or some potatoes or wanted something a little bit more, you know, substantial they could sit in their stomach. And that was the more somewhat depressing side of it. That was kind of hard to sort of take, like how normal it was to see people on the brink. And I feel like now, especially with the cost of living being as high as it is, you're seeing that kind of being amplified 10 times now. You're seeing people who are maybe functionally middle class dropping into the working class barrier or the working class bracket and legitimately struggling to put food on the table or to keep the lights on or to keep the gas on. All these sort of things that were kind of normal in the area that I grew up in are now being seen in wider parts of society and it's pretty bleak, I'm not going to lie. So let's pretty quickly read across this article where they talk about the food banks here. Um, this is a comment. It says, um, like Anne Marie, Sam also uses the village food bank. Volunteers at the toy library and is struggling to make an ends meet on benefits. Sam says um, she had to borrow money to cover the cost of looking after her two children, which is incredible. You had to borrow money to to get a babysitter. Like, jeez. Drive around Pestwood, sorry, Pestwood, and walk around, and you can see beautiful houses, some very lovely areas. But there are places like where I live that is very deprived. I do feel like there is a major gap. I'm borrowing money, unfortunately, which is going to put me into debt. I can only speak about what I see and where I live, and like we're very much hidden. She says her financial worries are affecting her mental health. It's been a very hard time, especially with Christmas coming up. You don't want to let your children down. And keeping the heating on is this cold weather. So electric, or gas, all of that, it costs a lot higher than it was. It's a very big struggle. And one of the things I remember as well about growing up in those sort of areas is the, the sort of contrast was crazy all the time. Because in those poverty ridden areas that I grew up in, there were some families that were pretty well off. And when I think back to it, well off, all it was was that two of the ha adults in the household were working a full-time job that was it but when i was growing up i assumed that they were i don't know that they owned flipping pepsico or something but essentially it was just two adults working full-time made you think they're well off because they had you know two cars um that had a big car so mom had a small car uh they always could put their kids in fancy clothes and designer trainers and whatnot and you were sitting there you know wearing hand-me-downs and charity shop clothes and stuff thinking damn man these guys are rich as hell and again all it was was just two people in the household working and so you can only imagine what it is nowadays but also the thing that was really hard to take was the contrast in terms of the areas so i remember once hearing wiley say on a dvd one time back in the day when you're talking about pirate radio and how i think if i remember correctly that like deja vu was on top of the building i think maybe around canning town silver town custom house sort of areas i remember there was a building where they used to do a lot of the pirate radio sessions used to happen and i remember wiley say something along the lines of ah oh, one of the things that sort of drove us was the fact that we would look at this overlook this sort of like overlook the whole area that we we're in from this tower block and we'd see where we're from that looks really run down and you kind of pan over to the right and you see canary wharf greenwich and all these amazing kind of luxury apartments and stuff and you think to yourself you know what once i get my money up that's where i'm gonna be and if you think about it now i think a lot of youtubers even especially black youtubers who are from london the first place they move to whenever they do get some money and they do start making some coin they get an apartment around those sort of areas in like southeast london these sort of greenwich sort of areas where the building kind of overlooks the thames and whatnot and you get these really great scenic views that sort of remind you of you know miami or las vegas or something crazy it's not really but you know the whole skyline is sort of lit up with these sort of skyscrapers and it's a nice thing time because you know usually your building's got a concierge you've got a nicer lift um you might have a gym in there a common area all these all these amenities that you never had growing up in the tower block like i did where sometimes the lift didn't work the door didn't work or one block i lived in you could legitimately open the door it had like a you know 
the security magnet doors but there was a technique that you could do where if you shook it enough times you could open the door yourself without having an absolute fob in it which is scary thinking back at it because that means anybody could come into your home but back then it was quite cool because it meant that you didn't have to carry the keys because one thing back in the day your mum didn't want to give you was the keys because the fob took you know was a lot of money to replace and you'd be out there playing around being dumb and you end up losing it and then your mum have to spend 40 pound of money that she didn't have to get a key fob you know done which might eat into your ability to eat during that week so it was crazy so the ability to open the door that way was pretty nuts so imagine going to a concierge building and you've got somebody saying hi to you in the morning you know handing you your flipping mail or you've got like a little mail room all these sort of amazing things happening right i can imagine it being pretty amazing and pretty fun to see those things in real time especially if you've been able to make some decent money from all that sort of stuff so life them times was weird life them times was hard and and i don't know i don't get any satisfaction from seeing people go through the things i was going through now uh but it does put into it does put into some sort of light just how tough it was back then and how weird it must be now if you never really had these sort of struggles to suddenly now get yourself up to go to a food bank um to get some amenities or some you know some basic needs that you need covered like you know beans and whatnot and flour and stuff like it's pretty wild man it really really is wild um another quote here heartbreaking so the difficulties experienced by Anne marie and sam seem all too familiar to amanda cook an executive teacher of the presswood village schools federation just over one um in 10 of her 400 pupils are on free school meals which while oh sorry let's read that again just over one in 10 of her 400 people are on free school meals while uh, 61 qualify for pupil premium, which gives schools extra money to support the most disadvantaged children. And those numbers are rising. Um, she says um, less well of parents of pupils with special education often struggle to obtain diagnosis for their children and find navigating the system to access the right support difficult the wealth in the area entrenches inequality in accessing services if a family have knowledge that and the money they can go and access the private pediatrician or obtain a private diagnosis and push it through the presswood food bank was set up by miss cook started meal packs for pupils in 2016 she described the situation as heartbreaking and it is it definitely is heartbreaking to see you know that amount of kids on free school meals clearly struggling i know for me personally those free school meals were a lifesaver sometimes in our school we'd have like breakfast that was free and sometimes the teachers would arrange for certain kids to come in early because i look back in there it all makes sense at the time you don't understand it because the teachers were so good back then at making sure people didn't see how much everyone was struggling and kind of respectful so you didn't tease anybody in school about it so the kids that were legitimately struggling would sometimes come in the morning and get breakfast the ones that didn't have any breakfast at home so you come in because I I used to buy the breakfast right so I think the breakfast was like subsidized so you get like you get a bowl of you know rice krispies for like twenty p or something which was crazy because they'd always give you a little bit more because the teachers or the people working in the sort of um in the cafes and stuff in our school were usually mums you know from the local area they, they, who knew you or knew your mum as well so they kind of always hook you up it was always really nice and good vibes and one thing you'd always rem notice whenever you'd go there there'd always be a group of kids there already like oh okay oh you already yeah yeah and they're kind of joking around and stuff and you just you know jam with them and whatever you won't really think too much of it but thinking back to it what you'd f forget was that most likely those kids were the ones that are really really in the depths of poverty i thought i was poor but they because they're way poorer where most likely the teachers were arranged for them to come early so that they didn't have to do it in front of the other kids and they'd get a certain amount of food for free and they'd be able to eat and I know some teachers or school dinner teachers did that for other kids during lunchtime. They'd hold off a couple of burgers, put them underneath and give a kid if they weren't able even to get free school meals or whatnot, or whatever it may be. All those things were put in place to make people's, you know, experience of school just that bit more bearable. And you have to respect and you have to give those teachers and those dinner ladies a lot of respect and a lot of honor for being able to deal with those sort of situations in a really dignified way. Really, really do, man. But yeah hopefully it gets better before it gets worse but you know in this situation it probably doesn't work out that way it has it has to get worse before it gets better but it is good to see it being reported you know on places like the bbc and people are kind of highlighting these sort of things so you actually know what the climate is like out there but this is what it's always been like in the areas that i've kind of grew up in it's kind of always been that case but it's nice to see it kind of being reflected and being kind of shun you know it's the a light's being shone on it and people are maybe seeing just how dark and bleak it can get for some people out there um and hopefully you know that inequality gets addressed some way shape or form and when we come out of this 
dire financial straits we're in at the moment people don't have to kind of live this way anymore going forward because you know this is the way man this isn't the way moving on with that one i want to quickly touch upon this article courtesy of the bbc another update regarding something i spoke about previously regarding the untimely passing of cody fisher r.i.p two men have been charged with the birmingham nightclub stabbing um, which is great news obviously um i said before i thought this was clearly something that was avoidable most likely some argy bargy on a dance floor over something dumb like someone stepping on your train or spilling a drink which could easily be sorted with a bit of fisty cuffs or a pushing match or a, a cussing competition or something but you know having to resort to stabbing somebody is just ridiculous i feel like in these instances and i hate the fact that men just can't have altercations that don't result in lethal force anymore i don't know why that is the case don't get me wrong fighting somebody in a nightclub with hard floors and punching him in the head and then banging their head on the floor isn't any safer than you know fighting somebody with a knife don't get me wrong but this inability for men to kind of sort out their differences that way or just even to get over them um is really really bizarre and obviously leads to um really tragic circumstances like we've seen here with the untimely passing of cody fisher and it says as follows um cammy carpenter 21 and remy gordon 22 both from birmingham have been remanded in custody the men who were also charged with a fray will appear before birmingham magistrates court in the 2nd of january you can imagine it probably was there if it's a nightclub they probably were there clubbing having a good time and just got into old occasions so they probably knew who it was a long time ago especially people that are at the scene so i don't think they probably struggled to find that out um, the Mr. Fisher 23, a non-league footballer and a school sports coach, was attacked at the Crane nightclub in Digbeth. A man 22 also is straight arrested on suspicion of the murder has been released on bail. And the fourth people and four people other people were arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender have been released on bail. Detective Chief Inspector Ian Ingram from West Midlands Police said the arrest was a significant development in our investigation as part of the Sikhs of Justice to Cody. He added officers were keen to hear from anyone else with further information on the incident. So I'm legitimately happy that the people who have done this have been caught because like I said, it was tragic and he didn't need to pass away like that. Clearly was somebody a lot of people had a lot of love for. You see the outpouring of affection and love from his friends on social media was really uh, difficult to read at the time. So clearly that's nice to see. The only thing that wasn't great to see was obviously the reaction that the local council had to the local nightclub. I think their license has been suspended, which is always the kind of regular route they go on whenever a tragedy like this happens in a nightclub. Instead of actually doing some sort of um, uh, consultation and figuring things out, they always go to the point of, oh, let's suspend the license. Let's close down the club. Um, when clearly this is an isolated incident, Maybe it was the wrong place, wrong time. Maybe it was two people that already had problems with each other, you know, butting heads with each other in a nightclub and it was only going to go one way. I'm not too sure, but either way, you know, punishing a nightclub for this, I feel like was a bit over the top um, and there could have been a way to sort of deal with it amicably. I didn't result in them having a lesson suspended and having people, you know, lose their jobs temporarily because of such a tragedy that ensued. I don't really think that makes any sense in my opinion, but hey, what do I know? what do i know and then another update regarding another story that i spoke about which is a really happy update i have to be honest because i wasn't the most um positive when it came to you know receiving good news on this but it has kind of turned around for the better this is courtesy of los angeles times it says rapidus rapper sorry Fiofis london found safe after being reported missing in la family member says so we would have known that rapper Fiofis london went missing I was reported missing a couple few weeks back, but had been missing, I think, since June or July or something, which was crazy. Um, his family came out and put out statement, filed an official missing persons report in LA. And then quite soon after, it felt like a few people around town had been seeing him around. Um, one particular guy ended up getting a video partial of him, ended up basically, you know, confronting him in public to the point where I think whoever said something to him like, oh, leave me alone or something crazy like that and um when the guy reported back he said you know first of London clearly wasn't in the right mental state um he wasn't in a good place clearly by looking at him but he was alive so that was some encouraging news and then a couple of days after we hear confirmation from the family that he's fine and safe but so far we've heard no other information as to what actually happened and where he was we can you know um hypothesize and say maybe it clearly was something to do with drugs that maybe led him to this point but it was just sad to see somebody who legitimately was at the forefront of culture was the forefront of 
you know that alternative um, music scene for a while and kind of you know the main or maybe one of the only person who basically looked like him a young black dude who was making the music that he was making at that time pushing things forward doing really cool collaborations embraced by the fashion community had ties to streetwear ties to sneaker culture like really able to weave all these worlds in together at one time and then suddenly get to a point where he is you know essentially living homeless you know out there in these la streets is absolutely tragic but it's nice to see that he has been found by his family and hopefully he's going to be on the mend sooner rather than later so the article says as follows um london's uh, cousin michael noel posted a photo of the 35 year old musician on instagram and the caption says we found theo he is safe and well at this time the family would love prayers and privacy thank you all which is a bit you know a bit difficult to take considering you know they brought the issue to the internet the internet helped to find him um i think the internet might have found him before the family did and now that they found him it's privacy needed can you not tell us what happened can you not give us a bit of a you know a kind of you know bullet points of why this guy was missing for so long why he wasn't reported missing earlier why he was completely dark from his family since july and stuff like i don't know some details but maybe you're being a bit too nosy who knows it continues Noel said he appreciated everyone's help in finding his cousin it's refreshing and rewarding to have such a strong support system of family and friends um the los angeles police department did not confirm that london had been found london had not been contacted since sorry london had lost last been in contact with somebody on october 15th police said that day he left his home in ventura boulevard and was last seen on skid row so he must have had some sort of crazy night out on the 15th onwards that didn't result in him going back home because that's basically what essentially happened but for some reason some people hadn't heard from him since july and it's obviously family hadn't heard from him since october or maybe since before that but still it's a good thing that he's been found i'm happy about that and hopefully he's on the mend regardless but this maybe is a bit of a cautionary tale as well for artists coming up of just how left things can go you can go for one minute being the you know the toast of paris fashion week collaborating with carl lagerfeld hanging out with kanye west mark ronson all these amazing people and then suddenly it can go completely left where you're legitimately you know up and down skid row looking a bit skittish and clearly not in your best mental state and without a hat that's what i've, I've that's what i knew he was in bad in a bad place i saw that blurry far picture of the london in la somewhere with no hat on i was like okay cool this guy's in a bad place right now because probably the hat got pawned for some money to buy whatever else he needed to buy but all that aside i'm happy he's back happy he's alive and hopefully he's on the mend and he's got the right people around him because again another thing to note you know during this whole entire search process it felt like a lot of the people that were clout clout you know sucking clout out of him these clout vampires legitimately went quiet and went ghost and didn't want to contribute or help to the effort in terms of searching for him which may they may have the reasons for because they have their own personal issues with the guy but i thought that was a little bit in bad taste i think if it was me i would have been able to put those bygones to one side and help to find him they couldn't do so and that maybe says a lot about his quote-unquote friends and who they actually are as people so hopefully that would be something that will kind of open his eyes and maybe he kind of gets to the point where the only people that he needs to be around are around him to that point maybe it's addiction maybe whatever else i'm happy he's alive happy he's safe so um get well soon for your first london get well soon sir get well soon then i wanted to talk about this this is flipping amazing this is the article courtesy of the business insider which is absolutely awesome because funnily enough i used to work at this company i used to work at this company that they're featuring and they've legitimately exposed all the things that i kind of knew about in the background but didn't really but now it's funny to kind of see it kind of happening and it kind of obviously legitimately led to the demise of this company which is obviously great to see i'm not going to lie the company i'm talking about is pollen so i worked for pollen very briefly very very briefly and again it didn't end well right it didn't end well it's just it did not end well <laughs> yeah it did not end well let's just put that out there it did not end well i got told to f off because i did the bare minimum and i did not care about the job in the slightest and you know i just whatever yeah i wasn't the best employee there let's just say that cool but i had my suspicions about pollen and the whole entire company what they did from the minute one because essentially what it was which i didn't know about the kind of the the things that happened behind the scenes have when you only sign up to a festival or you sign up to attend an event somewhere and you get given you get sent these emails oh we're 80 percent sold out of this particular package um 
we've got this new package that you can buy. Um, look who's announced on the lineup. Uh, whatever it may be, right? Referral link gets you this. You know, those, you always thought they were coming from the person that you were, sorry, the event that you were going to, right? They were coming from Glastonbury, whatever it's going to be called. But essentially what they're coming from is like um, these event management companies that do the kind of back-end work for these places. So what they do is that they're the ones sending out the email promotions, the deal promotions, all these sort of things. They're managing the ticket flow, all this sort of nonsense. Whereas on the face of it, it looks like it's coming from Glastonbury or Primavera, but really it's coming from these companies. And you're basically in charge of that. So you would basically get a group of events that you would do, you know, what cream fields, strawberry and something, whatever it may be called. And you'd be responsible for essentially maintaining um, the sales of that event and making sure they hit a certain threshold. And I don't know how they took the profits. I'm not sure if it was from the tickets or something, but that's how the whole company sort of worked. And naturally, I think naturally, because it was a, a, a company that was sort of situated in that kind of events party festival type scene it attracted a certain type of person a person who also liked to attend parties festivals and whatnot and also somebody that probably was a little bit you know outgoing in their sort of uh, temperament and clearly somebody that you know you would imagine wasn't much of a wallflower and there was a lot of those personalities in one office which is simply i feel like maybe they're not the right mix of people i feel like when you're in a it's like working in a fashion company. I think like it's one thing to have every. I think if you have everybody in a fashion company that's got a passion for fashion, it can maybe get a little bit toxic very quickly because everybody in there secretly maybe um, envies or despises the founder. They all think they're flipping, you know, Alex, you know, um, Alexander McQueen themselves. They maybe should, they maybe think that this job is beneath them. I don't know. There was a weird air about everything going on in there. Everybody had maybe these kind of failed dreams or these dreams that they were chasing while they're doing this job. I don't know. It just seemed strange. That's just me coming from the outside in looking, right? And it's also me, you know, talking it from a real unbiased, rational point of view, even despite my own issues I had with them. Then, of course, another sort of thing as well that I thought was really strange about the whole entire thing was that it just always felt like it was a rave going on in there. There was always kind of like a party atmosphere. It never felt like there was serious work being done. There was serious work being done, don't get me wrong, because I couldn't do the serious work. That's why they told me to F off. But I still feel like there was always a little bit of a lack of seriousness in the stuff that they did. And maybe that was a cultural thing or whatever they, they were going through, you know. But clearly this article from the Business Insider um, kind of details a lot of the stuff and kind of does put a bit of credence on the feelings that I had when I initially went there. So it's courtesy of Vincent Sider. It says, non-stop partying, lavish spending, and sexual harassment allegations, um, acquisition, sorry, inside the self-destructive pollen, the music startup once worth $800 million. Look at these two wild lads. Look at them. Look at them. And these are usually, these are the type of people that you go and interview with at these kind of startups, right? And they've got this company and they, they try and make you feel like you're not cool, which is funny because obviously you're there to get employed, but they try and act like they're cooler than you. It's like, no, you guys aren't cool. You just managed to find a way to get funding to start this company. Fair enough. But just because you go to these events doesn't make you cool. Doesn't make, doesn't, you know, it's not like a personality trait. That's another thing as well. People that go to festivals and events and feel like that's their personality, you're a dork. You're a loser. Get a personality, get some hobbies, get some interest. But clearly these guys thought a way, 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 way more of themselves than I did. And I never really understood it. In, from just the outside point of view, it's like, you guys aren't cool in the slightest. I just want to work here because I want a job. I don't necessarily care, you know what I mean, about like this, what you're doing. I just want a job. But clearly you have to pay the game and act like you do care and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I did a good enough job in that regard. But it continues. It says, yeah, about 400 million Poland employees were camped out in the Mondecito County, California for five straight days of partying in 2019. <laughs> honestly man it was good. life was good pre-pandemic eh? um for five straight days of partying the uk-based events and travel startup founded by callum and his brother liam niggas niggas fancy right let's let's keep a term on that one had raised nearly 30 million in venture capital funding and the brothers wanted to celebrate they put staffers up in cabins and camp glamping tents and hosted full-blown festivals with djs acrobatic dancers um concordianists and slaves no, I'm <laughs> in all the retreat cost the company five hundred thousand dollars according to four former employees attendees just about every drug under the sun 
cocaine, MDMA, acid, mushrooms, ketamine. It was harder to find, not find drugs than it was to find them, one former employee said. Staff has drank so much alcohol that pollen employees had to run out and buy more. Yes! And this was happening during the week. This is one of the first places I worked in my entire life where I felt like I was being approved. And if you know me personally outside of work, right, you know I get down. I get lit. I get I turn up, right? There is once the once I crank up the volume, there's no bringing that shit down. I'm going all the way up. I'm like in a barbershop, like you know, I'm blaring something and talking to you at the same time. I go up. I'm noisy. So I went there and I legitimately felt like a prude. I legitimately felt like a like a lame because I didn't want to partake in the drinking and the going out culture during a week. I was already struggling to keep up with the flipping workload as was, right? I didn't understand what the point of all this was. And now here you are offering me drinks and going to the bar and buying or going to the shop around the corner and buying bottles of beer. And, you know, people clearly look like they've done some lines in the toilet. I'm like, God damn, what the hell's going on? It's only 2 p.m. on a Wednesday. What's happening here? Like, legit. The best thing about that place, though, that was really fun, the office that I worked at, I think it was in that Elephant and Castle, I think, around that area. Is it Elephant and Castle or Vox? I don't know. Somewhere in South was that, there was a gym that no one used, it looked like, for the most part. There were some people who used it, don't get me wrong. I think some people in the product team, I think, used. But I didn't really see people work using it when I was using it. It was normally empty. And I'd be going in there on a bench press, like, you know, every hour or so after doing work, I'd go in there doing it on a bench press. It might explain why I got taught to skin dazzle. But every hour or so, I'd be on a bench press, like, getting some reps in. I'd be on a pull-up bar to get the squat rack, do some overhead presses, do some deadlift, just quickly knock them out. And that was quite fun. I'm not going to lie. We were just to quickly pop into a room and bump out some bench presses and some push-ups and sit because I'm that psycho you know sometimes that like you're if you've been in a workplace sometime and you you know you're walking around your workplace you're having a coffee and you hear someone go <laughs> i'm that guy in the court hallway somewhere doing some push-ups like i don't know why i love doing that sort of shit or some escort somewhere around <laughs> so if you give me a room where there's that equipment that i can use and kettlebells and stuff i'm gonna take advantage of it so i thought that was pretty sick but i do remember the daily consumption of alcohol and drug taking turned me down a little bit i was like okay i'm gonna turn down a bit there's no turn up for what turn down for something it continues the article one morning a top pollen executive visited the breakfast hall three times in a row telling a bemused underling on the third visit that he'd just woken up <laughs> a staffer described the retreat as a complete debauchery one attendee who did both cocaine and acid at the retreat knock um, one of the craziest experiences I've ever had in my life. That shit was fucking insane. Um, a poll representative said the incident with the executive never took place and the company never conducted the narcotics, believed it was unacceptable in the work environment. Lies! <laughs> I saw that and more. Uh, the representative added that they had no complaints from any employees about drugs and company retreat received 9 out of 10 in our employee satisfaction survey. Of course it did if you're giving them free coke and MD. Oh, the one good thing they had about it actually in the workplace was there was actually always, always a good group of like dudes, cool dudes, hot girls if you're into that sort of thing. Um, what else? Oh, the work schedule was the working, if I remember correctly, it was the first place I remember you could work at, you could work from home. That, that thing, that was pretty, this was pre-pandemic. So if you wanted to work from home, you could, which wasn't, you know, um, advisable because there was so much like, there was so much in there's so much like kind of cross talking, like in the moment, like, oh, this stuff is happening. You all put it. There's too much information happening at once. So it was kind of always annoying me. So you kind of had to be in the office to kind of actually, you know, get to the core of what needed to be done and kind of get a handle on how to do certain things. But it was nice to have that option available, especially someone like myself who, you know, lived far away. It was nice to be able to kind of, you know, mix things up some bit, whatnot it may be. But apart from that, that place was just like turn up for what all the time you know, the lunches, and, you know, as soon as the people, I felt, it felt like to me, at first, I remember when I was there, people would work late often, right, there would be a lot of people that wouldn't leave on time, and at first I thought, oh, rah, these guys are working hard, man, like, props on you, innit, especially for me that was struggling to kind of get to grips or everything, it was sort of handy to have people around that you could rely on and help, you know, help you out with certain things, and also have set a good example, because, you know, in workplaces, I always say, especially someone myself, someone myself who's come from retail, I say office life is so much easier than retail because office life, you can kill it easily by just showing a little bit, uh, you know, by being a little bit more, um, by having, using, using your initiative a little bit, being hardworking 
and just you know these little things that you you learn from retail you can apply to the office and you can kind of get promotions really quickly or increase your pay really quickly responsibilities whatever it may be um but one thing i remember seeing which was really interesting was that after a while i noticed people weren't staying late because they wanted to work hard they were staying late because once you stayed late it meant you could get away with a lot more people that were in there were ready to party have a good time and clearly if you stay there until seven or eight there's no you're not going home now are you so you might as well go to the bar and grab a drink you might as well go and do other things like that's what it was basically happening and you see it happening a lot from like wednesday onwards was like people would certainly start to turn up and whatnot and those late nights again would turn into let's work hard into like you know let's party hard which is always hilarious to me but also we're not surprising because like i said the the company is an events company it kind of pushed themselves kind of being you know gen z before gen z it attracted a lot of people who are in a state of arrested development right a lot of kind of 18 going on 30 year olds or 30 year olds going on 18 which is always a bit of em- bit embarrassing in that way like clearly you know somebody that only started taking care a couple of years ago and acting like they've been on it since forever and whatnot somebody who just the other day were listening to taylor swift is now into avici and think they're doing something i don't know i i just i just i got the feeling a lot of them were dorks but I also kind of got a lot of feeling that a lot of them kind of clearly enjoyed what they were doing and felt a lot of kind of camaraderie with their brothers and sisters working with and felt like it was a good damn time. But I saw through it all and thought it was a bit lame. Maybe that's what maybe turned, maybe why I kind of turned off to it and it kind of led to the bitter end it led to. But I find this all fascinating regardless. Three years later, Pollen's parent company, Street Team, Software Limited went bankrupt. About 430 employees were let go without their final paychecks. (laughs) <laughs> as of july 20th this year pollen and its subsidiaries owed customers 8 million in refunds according to the internal spreadsheet obtained by inside <laughs> from outside pollen's collapse was a shock when the niggas when the niggas niggas fancy brothers niggas um callum 32 and liam 29 founded the company originally called verve that's when i used to work with them it's called that in 2014 um i think it's now yeah it was verve and it's all under pollen the brothers saw the lightning success thanks to their curated experiences, which packaged music festivals with stays at luxury hotels. In seven years, Pollen raised more than $200 million from venture capitalists and worked with some of the biggest names in music, including Justin Bieber, 50 Cent, and Scooter Braun. You see Justin there. Um, but according to 31 former employees who spoke with Insider, the company's implosion was years in the making. Any one of you that spoke to the journalists out there, you guys are knobs. Never speak to journalists, man. Never, ever, ever, ever. Unless they're offering you money. And even then, never speak to journalists. But hey, do what you have to do. Making said brothers ran pollen a little much, uh, a little too much like they ran their festivals. The drugs were often present. Heavy drinking and partying seemed to be part of the job description. The company culture facilitated questionable behavior. Some stuff was said, <laughs> yeah. I saw that questionable behavior. <laughs> Several people employees listed sexual harassment as one of the concerns of pollen. Oh, really? Everybody drinking during the day and doing drugs during the day, during the week, would lead to some unfortunate instances with the opposite sex. Who would have thought? Um, one woman told Insider that Liam touched her butt inappropriately. Yo. Another woman who said uh, was paid a settlement by Pollum after outlining a complaint of sexual harassment by Callum. Holy smokes. Dozens of expense reports viewed by Insider showed lavish spending with the brothers included 52000 on a luxury villa in Ibiza. Okay, for sure they they weren't using that to flip in, you know, to buy fucking agave bowls and whatnot, right? Uh, the dash, their, their rash decision making could lead to chaos. In January 2022, fans of customers flew to Playa de Carmen, Mexico, for a massive techno festival called Departure, while COVID-19, sorry, COVID-19 numbers were rising in the region. After the Mexican government issued a 50% capacity cap on the mass events, including concerts, Poland abruptly cancelled the event. Um, some customers told Insider they still hadn't been refunded as of November. As the buzz around Poland intensifies, the Negus Fancy Brothers wanted to move faster, make events bigger, and take more risks. They saw an opportunity to not only change the way people experience the entertainment industry, 
but to join the ranks of tech elite. Investors came flocking, cash poured in, and they adopted the persona of high-flying, high-rolling executives, but in the startup world, faking it until you make it have disastrous results. Um, yeah, not really. Sometimes it works out well for you, honestly. I've seen it too often in these startups. Sometimes you fake it till you make it, and then you get the funding, and then you sell the product that you are making, and then you bounce on to do something else. That's not a failure to me, mate. You're up in that respect because you've invested a small amount, you cashed out with a big amount, and now you've got a win on your CV. I used to think that they didn't understand the risk that they were blindly optimistic, but now I think they were just liars, said one former employee. Oh, really? You just realized that they were lies now. I'm not really sure when the tables turned, but it's kind of disgusting how they treated people. It is what it is, isn't it? Uh, they dropped out of Poland University. People would joke, Callum could squeeze money out of a rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, see what I told you about. People that do IV drips out of their party. I'm telling you, this, these, these niggas were sharing this stuff on their own social media platforms, brother. Huh? Their own social media platforms. They're sharing pictures of them taking IV drips on flipping resorts during work holidays and whatnot. Are you absolutely dumb? Come on, man. Um, says so yeah, yeah. Callum was the face of pollen. With his boyish looks and bell cut, he was a smooth talker who didn't own a suit and could charm the most skeptical of investors. One employee said they were brought on, brought to tears by an email he wrote about his passion for pollen. <laughs> you see what I mean about having people in your office that are all passionate about something? It leads to absolute dog shit. Honestly, passion for fashion, passion for design, passion for sneakers, passion for whatever. If you have too many passionate people that work in one place, it can always, it's always into disaster. You shouldn't have to have just workers, people who just don't give a shit about events. They don't go out themselves. They're boring. They just, they don't care. And they just do the work. That's what you need. Absolute ninjas, absolute soldiers on the front line. Not people that secretly want to be, you know, um, Carl Cox themselves. They secretly want to own a print works themselves. They secretly want to be the Martinez brothers. They they secretly want to be Nina Krapis and flipping a melee lens. Nah, you need people in there that just want to work. And these people, look at them. They're crying over a fucking email. These people are people probably the same people that were crying behind Fred again when he was playing at Boiler Room. Like, get a life, man. Grow up. Flipping hell. Anyway, he greeted people with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Definitely didn't kiss me. People will joke that Callum would squeeze money out of a rock. Another former employee said, long time employee said, Callum's lack of formal education was what initially attracted the pollen. Yeah, well, it looks. See, all the dummies and the passionates all go there, innit? Yeah, it makes sense. Meanwhile, another Poland staffer said that despite working there for months, he never saw Liam's face. Many ex employees said that they had was known to keep his cam keep his camera off during in meetings. Um Liam was moody and unpredictable, sometimes snapping at staffers out of nowhere. As chief revenue officer, he brokered deals with artists and revenue. Da -da. Um, according to one former employee, Liam also used Poland's corporate card to fund a number of personal expenses, including IV drips for hangovers. Free employee said, of course he did. Look how dumb this. Look at this. Look at this. Um, and, and I say look at this because it's a picture of Liam um, on the couch with these young ladies applying an IV drip to him during a hangover, I'm assuming. As COVID-19 locked lifted, the Cooped Up College Students Festival of, uh, lovers flocked to Poland's events. In 2021, the company saw a 13, 300% increase. Whoa. Investors took note in April 2022, four months before joining, going broke. Four months before they went broke. Four months. Poland has secured $150 million in Series C funding from backers including Kindred, North Zone, Siena Capital, Slingshot and the company to an $800 million valuation. So they're on the brink of being valued at a billion dollars. This nonsense company that just sent you fucking emails and annoying spam text messages telling you a festival was 90% sold out when it hadn't sold one ticket, selling you dumb packages that you didn't need, right? Huh? They were nearly listed as a $1 billion company while the founders were there sniffing coke off of strippers' backs, inappropriately touching staff members, staff members drinking all the way throughout the entire week, some of them probably functional alcoholics, right? And they were nearly valued at a billion dollars. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible out there. If you put your mind to anything, you can achieve it too. If these two absolute dullards were able to comp create a company that employed my dumbass and your dumbass out there, then clearly <laughs> we're missing out on something. Holy shiz. While Silicon Valley 
Um, investors might have been too jaded by the WeWorks of the world to throw cash at another pair of party boy founders. The UK tech scene was never was newer, sorry, smaller and more willing to take risk on entrepreneurs like Callum and Liam, according to Rob Kinners, a partner at the Hoxton Ventures, a top early stage venture capital firm in London. Hoxton Ventures. You deserve to lose your money. Hoxton fucking ventures. What you're invested in? Food trucks, ghost kitchens. How revolutionary. Some of these investors considered hard partying behavior like Callum's and Liam's to be part of the package. Yeah, of course. Rockstar founders, isn't it? I hope next year, similar to what I said before in a pod, I hope next year, I hope this year, sorry, this is the year of not believing people. Number one, people just come out and say stuff. Just don't believe them. Don't believe them. Wait until there's more evidence to the story, right? Or wait until you hear more. Just don't believe people straight away when they say things. And also, I hope this is the year where we get back to like, Having actual experts do things, right? People that actually demonstrate skill, talent, um, understanding, acumen, um, rational thinking, insight, right? Foresight. Let's go back to that. So just taking a chance on somebody because you like the cut of their jib or because they are from the same place you are from or because they speak a certain way or because they wear hoodies or because they're coming to the office barefooted. No, 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 no. Let's just go back to actually having people that are absolutely competent in what they do first. Can we do that, please? Uh, back to one of the Poland's early stage investors is known to throw massive parties and fly around at be fun weekend. So the Negus Fancy Brothers antics probably didn't initially raise red flags. Honestly, the, the, the fact that their name is Negus Fancy is... <laughs> is <flipping them. laughs> Niggas fancy. Oh, God. Pollen's profile grew. Callum started connect cognitive hypnotherapy to help him become a better leader. I went to be lightly told forwards, but also I wanted to be able to do the right thing for the company. Callum made Pollen's career free, sorry, carefree culture a priority. One former employee recalled being whisked away from the day long scavenger hunt during their second week on the job. I just remember getting to the office at 10 a.m. and taking shots, and it's like Tuesday. Whoa. So maybe, maybe this actually shows me in a bad light, right? The fact that they were being so carefree and everything and I still couldn't ingratiate myself in it maybe shows me in a bad light. Maybe I'm the problem in this regard, right? Because there's this, there's this incredible party atmosphere which eventually it feels like a hostel. That's what it felt, it felt like a hostel. Imagine you, you know, when you go to a hostel and like you're over it after the first three or four days. That's what it felt like working there all the time. It was like being in a hostel. Like, everyone's in your business. Everyone's on top of you. There's all these stimuli coming at you that you can't really focus on properly. Um, there's these weird conversations with people that you're having where, is it actually a conversation? Are you just, like, wasting time talking to me because you don't, I'm just in front of you? Like, work that you've been given, is this necessary? Do we need to do this? What's the point? Like, all these weird things are coming at you all at once, and it's kind of hard to kind of keep a grip on them, right? And to kind of understand what's kind of going on. But it did feel very hostily, very hostily. Especially when you think about the girls that are walking through, right? You see, oh, that person's good. Oh, that person's hot. That person. It's just like it was okay, cool. Hostel vibes. The guy, sketch, 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 sketch. Oh, yeah, madness. Another staffer who was twenty when she was hired at Poland's Los Angeles office said that she was served mimosas on her first day at work. I would describe it as a frat, but a job. And at twenty, that was great because I was like, oh my gosh, first job at college is just a party. <laughs> <laughs> look at this to make it better a polar representative said alcohol was only served to employees of a legal drinking age oh that makes it much better isn't it at pollen retreats employees participated in speed dating game in which staffers sat in a circle answering another questions from prompt cards including some were sexually explicit of course promoted to, <laughs> to free employees <laughs> ah, honestly you're playing these speed dating games right B but but flipping Let's uh let's attack somebody if they dare to say that they like somebody in the office from just a purely you know admi admiration point of view. Oh my god, that person actually looked quite hot. I would actually like to that. Imagine dare somebody say that and approach it in a very respectful manner. But hey, let's have let's promote the speed dating. Let's do that. Let's promote speed dating and all that sort of malarkey. Of course, makes complete sense. Further participants holding the cards at 2017 resort show questions, including of people in this room. Who do you think is most likely to sleep with three other people in this room? Would you rather be a virgin forever, have sex with a sibling one time and break the curse? Yo, that's a mad question. Would you rather be a virgin forever or have sex with your sibling one time to break the curse? <laughs> Number one, the fact that you think virginity is a curse is an issue. <laughs> and the fact that it has to be your sibling to break it is also very much problematic. But anyway, we move. 
Our participation was not mandatory. One employee said that she left as she had to partake in the game, even though the question made her feel uncomfortable. If you don't engage with it or laugh about it, then you were seen as not fun and not getting involved. Beep, beep, beep. I didn't really go out to any of the drinks. I didn't really go out to any of the afters, really, to be honest. And I think, apart from my lack of working, right, my, my, um, my general inability to do the work that was necessary, I think that was maybe the main problem. I have to be honest, like my lack of ingratiating myself in that group, because I legitimately didn't find it cool. Like I came in there being somebody who had my own history, had my own life outside of it, that I clearly got up to loads of sort of mad stuff. And I mean, I'm like, I want to work, isn't it? Like, why are you, why, why have we turned this into like a, like a student halls? Like, what is this? And most of you guys are way too old for this. Like, why are you active? Like, your first, this is your first job out of college. Some of you guys have children, <laughs> you know. That's some self-respect, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And then there were company-hosted employee lockings. Yep, I I know about that one. That took place in venues including karaoke bars and roller rinks. While the monthly gatherings were billed as a team bonding activity, one former employee said that they were excused to get completely obliterated. Um, Callum Liam and sometimes took the party too far. Multiple former employees said during their parties at private Los Angeles residence, cocaine was often present. Super said this is like the issues are categorically untrue. <laughs> Uh, look man i'm not i'm not gonna snitch on certain people but god let's just say i have i have my own theories at one september 2018 looking at los angeles office callum hosted a female employee into his shoulders making her feel unsafe she told the insider the poor representative said that the while the calendar didn't record this when employees were celebrating big wins they hugged each other and high-fived um, one month prior, during a lock-in that started at the Angel City Brewery in downtown Los Angeles, four employees uh, saw Callum pour whiskey into employees' drinks without asking. <sighs> Including that of a 10-year-old staff, and one employee told this side that she was scared to look into away from a drink out of fear Callum would add alcohol to it. <laughs> Imagine your boss trying to get you wasted so you can fuck out. <laughs> Luckily, he wasn't doing that to her lads. Luckily, luckily. But oh my God, I'm so happy, man. That place was a pile of shit. And I'm glad <laughs> they told me to fuck up because I hated it for the moment I was there. So it's good to see that it was a pile of absolute horse shit. I'm not going to read the entire thing. I don't want to bore you. But honestly, the satisfaction I read listening to all this stuff and, you know, hearing about them securing the funding and then hearing them flipping blow it all away and the employees crying and complaining about it they were acting like they had the college and best job in the world it's absolutely satisfying to see there were some cool people there that i felt bad for because you lost your jobs and whatnot fair enough cool it is what it is but still for most of you <laughs> that's what you get in it that's what you fucking get absolute bullshit but hey <laughs> what do i know <laughs> oh honestly it makes me legitimately laugh when i see something like that it makes me legitimately laugh i cannot lie i cannot cannot bloody lie okay so moving on from that one we need to quickly touch upon this i thought this was pretty funny and a good way to sort of um embrace the nipper baby discourse has been a little bit exhausting to cover and to keep an eye on and whatnot for the most part because i feel like some of it has been conflated and construed and twisted to fit people's agendas and mostly from the reaction of people that are you know bona fide nipper babies that they don't seem to understand why some people would have an issue with the fact that they've been handed everything in life and given a platform that some people have to fight two for nail from or two for nail for and sometimes even fighting two for nail for it it doesn't actually mean that you get it in the end and i feel like the the premise initially of the nipper baby discourse was more so along the lines of hey if you're coming up in the middle industry or the entertainment industry whatever whatever industry you're in where these kind of uh, you know um, advantages are somewhat beneficial it is quite handy to know that if you're struggling it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the people that uh, got ahead of you are somehow there because they've been struggling more sometimes those people got there because they have an advantage of having a particular door open particular interact in you know introduction that affords them the ability to maybe skip a certain number of steps so i feel like the nipper baby um debate for me was more so here's some solace here's some comfort in knowing that the person that's in front of you that's also the same age has been afforded these privileges that's why they're there before you now it just means that you have to work harder to get the position that you're in but that might explain 
why people are where they are and also it might give you a more realistic idea of how far or how long it's going to take you to get to where you need to get to and also maybe it might help you to stop doing the whole like compare you know comparison thing um you know uh fomo thing whatever it may be feeling that you may have so that you can maybe kind of concentrate on the work and get yourself where you need to be but it wasn't i didn't feel like a criticism of nipper maybe it's because it just is what it is right i think in all intents and purposes if all of us i mean all of us myself included you know let's say working class middle class people decided one day okay i'm going to try my best to achieve all my dreams in every what facet that i can regardless of the industry and we work really really hard to slave away and to kind of establish ourselves and then we end up having kids you'd of course want to give those kids every advantage and opportunity that you got because you worked half of the opportunity so that they don't have to work as hard as you, right? That's kind of what you want to do. You kind of want to lay um, a sort of good foundation so that your kids can kind of work off of that and kind of allow them the abilities and opportunities that you never potentially had, which is essentially what nepo baby nepotism is in a way. It's kind of that ability to sort of like, you know, um, allow people within your family to kind of gain advantage from things that you basically had worked hard for to establish an industry that is traditionally hard to kind of crack. And we know as well that those introductions can go a long way because we know how, you know, how far an introduction from somebody that you know can go a long way. So imagine on top of it having people that are well-known in the industry. So it's kind of an easy thing to kind of wrap your head around. For some reason, I don't know why, but the Nepa babies themselves can't seem to accept that they've all seemed to have a very negative and um, combative reaction to it which maybe makes sense because i feel like if you're questioning a nipper baby or you're basically explaining how they got there in some way it's you it's you kind of questioning the validity of their career you're kind of calling into question why they're even there in the first place um their hard work their talent all this sort of things came into play which obviously is going to hurt their feelings because it doesn't matter if you get introduced or not you know into modeling you still have to walk those catwalks. You still have to maintain a certain weight. You still have to go to fitting. So you can get some head starts, but you still have to do the work. So I guess if you're a model in that industry, it can feel a little bit hard to take when people are saying that you don't deserve the position that you're in because you feel like you've worked hard. But obviously, if you're some girl from, you know, from the Balkans somewhere or you're some girl that was, you know, sent over here from Africa to go and model, you're not going to have a good time hearing some girl saying woe is me when you legitimately had to support an entire family off your model check and everything was handed to you in a silver platter i get it i get it i get it but i feel like Helly bieber's you know embrace of it was quite refreshing because clearly somebody that was i feel like a lot more self-aware than some of the other ones out there and she decided to put it on a t-shirt and this little crop top t-shirt that she wore out and about which is quite funny because clearly it was something that was arranged you would imagine um to get a paparazzi out there wearing some washed out jeans some good shoes and whatnot and a little t-shirt that says nipper baby out there on the front which is absolutely lovely then i had to of course go and google and find out what her nepotism is from and i never even knew did you know nipper flipping Hallie Bieber was half brazilian i had no idea i guess being half brazilian when you're white it's sort of like being half african when you're white it's like you know it doesn't really matter but still i had no idea if she's half brazilian her mum this lady here called kenya baldwin is brazilian and i had no idea that was the case and obviously her father being stephen baldwin so clearly that was something that you maybe would say is some form of nepotism in a way i don't really think so because what is she she's more of a model she's more of a muse um i'm not really sure if her mum gave her any sort of advantage to kind of get into the industry from what I can see, she was, what, a Brazilian graphic designer, it seems like here. Um, uh, obviously, very attractive in her own right. And then uh, Bolden, of course, is an actor. So I don't think that actually went any sort of way. Probably did it, probably could, who knows. But still, the fact that you're born into a family with you know good genetics and a pretty decent bank balance is going to afford you opportunities that maybe most people won't have able to have and maybe the connections as well being in LA and whatnot. But I did actually uh, like... The fact that she embraced it with this kind of, you know, T-shirt, this cropped up T-shirt number here out and about and sort of, you know, wore it with some sort of level of pride because that's all you have to do. That's essentially what you have to do. There is no other way to respond to these allegations that isn't going to make you look like an absolute crazy person because it's not that deep. It really isn't. You are never baby, so what? You know, like ideally we'd all like to be nepo babies we'd like all like the ability to have a have somebody introduce us and you know afford us the ability to jump some steps so we don't have to toil away you know in the flipping gulags trying to get ourselves recognized 
I know for myself, this is a really bad example, but I worked in a flipping bowling alley, you know, serving chicken nuggets and chips and stuff. And I got that job only because my dad's, my uncle basically, um, you know, was able to give me a good recommendation. And he was, I think, the janitor or something of the bowling alley, right? And he gave me, an, you know, basically told the manager, hey, if you need somebody, uh, please get my nephew in here and he can work. And that was the first job I ever had. And I'm so thankful for at the time because I legitimately was struggling even to get an interview with flipping JD Sports. They would never take us. And that was not their fault as well because I was coming out of secondary school, um, I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken, and I had no experience. All I had was like the two years experience you have going to do you know, um, what's that thing that you do? Two weeks experience, going to do uh, work experience. We'd have here in the UK where you'd go and you'd work in a particular sort of industry that you wanted to do in, you know, you wanted to kind of have a job in when you, it's kind of hard to, to summarize because it makes no sense because how would you know what you want to do as a job when you're 16? But still, that is sort of program that you do. <clears throat> and I ended up working in an electronic shop somewhere in Tottenham Court Road selling cameras it was awful horrible place to work in and the owners made it really awful and horrible and then at the end he said hey we did this on purpose because we want you to know how difficult it will be for you as an adult once you if you leave college so make sure you don't come back here and it was a really valuable lesson a bit corny a little bit qbc-ish but it kind of led me on a straight and narrow to the point where i went to university did all the good stuff from everything going forward but one thing i do remember is that that first job in that bowling alley where i was working behind the chicken you know the fried food counter on my own i take people's money run to the back make chips and hot dogs and chicken nuggets and stiff and shit and popcorn and whatnot that was legitimately one of the hardest jobs i had but also the best because it allowed me the opportunity to have money to you know take girls out to the cinema buy myself flipping trainers and whatnot and go out and eat or whatever a few times during the week and i wasn't getting paid anything I, you know after i remember one time after a month of working i just about had like 500 pounds which is absolutely horrible i remember nearly crying thinking what the amount of working you know the taxes took it out of me but still i only got that job because my uncle if it's not for my uncle working in that job as a flipping janitor, right? It wasn't even like he was the owner or the CTO, just as a friendly neighborhood janitor with the keys, you know, make sure everything was working, cleaning up of some stuff here and there, whatever it may be. And he is able to give me the opportunity to get in that kind of place. And I was so thankful for it. You know, that it's, 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 it doesn't, it's not it's crazy to assume somebody working in an industry such as the entertainment industry in Hollywood where it's notoriously difficult to get into. There is no straight route to get into that sort of industry. Why it would be advantageous to have somebody known to tell you, hey, to give you an intro, to kind of give you an arm around the shoulder, to introduce the phone to people, open a couple of doors, put some CT people in a couple of emails. That stuff goes a long way and it's very, very much welcomed. I know I would welcome it if it was me. I'd be all over it. I'd be all over it like in a heartbeat, legitimately be all over it in a heartbeat. So I see nothing wrong in it personally. And people are completely overreacting. Um, I think if anything, especially the Nipper Babies featured in our article on Vulture, they're, they're living in an eternal state of hell because a lot of them are very, you know, obscure Nepo Babies, people who maybe are under the tutelage of, you know, very well-known people. So you're having to kind of try to uh, match or you know um beat the success of your 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 parents who you're never going to you know eclipse in any way shape or form you have the weight of your of their name on the on your back that you didn't ask for um you have the expectation of people around you that you didn't ask for either you want to live a regular smegular life people are looking at you like you're wasting your platform like all these unnecessary pressures coming at you from left and right can make life pretty miserable for someone being a member it's not all it's not all roses out there for sure it's not all roses especially if you've been if you've grown up to think that's normal you're not going to have the level of appreciation that maybe a regular smuggler people would have right um the hustle might not be the same either because you're not poor you don't you know you don't literally have to fight for every breadcrumb that's on your table and you're always got an allowance or something that's kind of coming in that kind of it makes life a bit more comfortable uh, I can only imagine how much hellish that can be. And I'd much rather be on the brink of poverty than, you know, living in those laps of luxury and then trying to work hard. It just, it must be such so hard to even to switch that mindset over. So it's not all champagne and toast, mate. I can definitely tell you that. But yeah, I like the teacher from Helly Beaver. I thought she, in, in, you know, embraced it a little bit better than most people. And clearly she's one of the ones that kind of gets it and isn't that offended when people call her out for being one because it's not really that deep in my opinion. But hey, what do i know what do i know okay so that has been the excellent English show episode number 637 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you're the first time tuning into the show you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave a comment down below 
if you're watching this via the youtube app of course make sure you smash that like and subscribe because i'm trying to hit 50,000 subs by the end of this year with my news resolution so make sure you pass the show on to somebody else if you think they're gonna like it let them know about taz let them know about the Xing show let them know about me that'd be greatly appreciated if you're watching this um via the video portion we'll just fade to black unfortunately i'm sorry about that if you listen to this via the audio platform you hear my tune today and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace